This week's interview on the mixtape with Scott, I had the chance to interview a good friend of mine, Jonah Gelbuck, professor of law at Berkeley. Jonah tells a great story in this interview. How he moved from UMass Amherst, where he was influenced by the famous Sam Bowles, to MIT uh, during a very heady time in the 90s. Uh, he tells the story of going through economics, uh, an econometrician by training who made seminal contributions from both applied topics like heterogeneous treatment effects with Marianne Bettler and Hillary Hoynes in an 06 American Economic Review article, as well as econometric, applied econometric suggestions uh, in theory with Doug Miller and Colin Cameron in Review of Economics and Statistics on Clustering and bootstrapping with small clusters, both of which readers are probably very familiar with. A successful economist, he was tenured at Maryland and Arizona before taking a sharp 180-degree turn to go to law school, of all things, Yale. Uh, again, the road less traveled along a lot of dimensions and where he has enjoyed a second career as a professor of law. The JD PhD path, it's not an uncommon uh, path for economists, but it's not a uh, it's not common either. There's a few of them out there. And in addition to wanting to talk to these interesting economists, I also wanted to talk to a few of them and just sort of learn more about this part of the profession where economists sometimes end up going. Again, the purpose of the podcast is twofold. The oral history of the profession from the last 50 years told through the personal stories of living economists. And it was my pleasure to talk to Jonah, one of my favorite economists out there, uh, so thank you for supporting the podcast. If you like it, share the interview. I hope you enjoyed it. Okay. Well, this is a, a, a real pleasure um, to have on the, the mixtape uh, podcast, uh, a guy that I've kind of known casually for a long time, but we've only, this is probably the only time we've talked where I can see Jonah's face. So uh, uh, Jonah, thank you so much for being on the, on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me, Scott. Can you, for the sake of the listener, uh, tell us your name, your job title, and uh, where you work? Sure. Uh, so my name is Jonah Gelbach, and I am the Herman F. Selvin Professor of Law at the University of California, Berkeley. Oh, okay, cool. All right. But you are an economist also. Do you still identify as an economist, or is it is that like you don't even do it anymore? No, no, I, I identify as an economist and a law professor. I guess, I guess I'm supposed to say lawyer as well, so... Uh, so I identify as both those things. I still, you know, think a lot about economics when I'm thinking about law. I think about economics a lot. I, I have some economics, at least one project going um, that it's, you know, straight econometrics, actually. So uh, so I'm doing both. Cool. Cool. Yeah, it's funny. Um, uh, when I was talking to some people in tech and they would like they were PhD economists and they would go get jobs as data scientists, I would always think like, well, doesn't it? does that hurt your feelings? Like you you can't call yourself an economist anymore. And, and I was like, sort of realizing I, I might be the only one who thinks that way. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, okay. I mean, you know, to, to, to coin a phrase, what's in the name. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, here, here's the icebreaker. What, what's a childhood vacation that you think of from time to time, even today, may, not necessarily your favorite uh, vacation, but one that you sort of has burned in your memory for whatever yeah. reason. I'll give you two, actually. So one is, I was just actually, my mom was just visiting uh, over the weekend, and uh, we were just talking about uh, a trip w we took when I was uh, 14, I think. Um, she took me to France. She did her dissertation research in France, um, and uh, and and is, was, and I think is still pretty close to being fluent in French. Um, I took French in high school uh, as a consequence, and she took me there for a couple of weeks. So we were just talking about that. Uh, and it was a great trip. I, you know, first first time really eating the kind of food that you get in Europe. And, uh, you know, we wasn't we weren't I didn't grow up in a hotbed of cuisine, especially. So this was a, a, a neat experience and got to go see some great museums and see the countryside. Um, the other uh, vacation I'll, I'll mention um, when I was, I guess, 16, my uh, dad uh, took me and uh, and my sibs to uh, the Bahamas, and uh, my brother and I discovered the casino. <laughs> oh yeah! Um, so that's why that one sticks out. But yeah, the, the casino and actually the lower drinking age. Uh, <laughs> what what games did you and your brother play uh, at the casino? Just a little too much blackjack. Blackjack, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you have to be really. You have to. You boy, you might have been good. You're like that mathematical mind. You could probably remember all the remember all the cards. 
I, it's possible that I did learn a thing or two, but uh, what, what I didn't quite grasp was the extremely high probability of losing all of my money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. That's right. You just need to get, you need to win one time very early on and believe that you're oh, you've got yeah. a lot of skill and then you'll lose all your money. Exactly. Um, or keep at it either one. Yeah. Keep at it. Right. So, well, so where did you grow up? I grew up in Stamford, Connecticut. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so and, but, your mom, but your mom was doing her doctoral work in France. Where was she doing it? Y years earlier. Yeah. So um, she was I, mm, uh, an, outside of Bordeaux, uh, like mm -hmm. the city, like outside of the city of Bordeaux in the Bordeaux region. Um, she's a, uh, her degree is in political science and, um, she did a lot of, uh, work on public administration, um, uh, particularly in the mental health system. And, um, oh. she was studying the French mental health system at the time, I believe. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's kind of similar to you. You also have been very interested in, in public, public programs. Did you get that? You think, is that stuff that you and her sort of have talked about? Well, I'm um, sure. I mean, I've talked to her about my research over the years and, and certainly some about hers, although, her degree was in political science and um, the, so the, the angle she was coming at public administration from was uh, quite a bit different from my kind of my earlier work as uh, I guess we've talked some in the past um, was about primarily about the uh, cash assistance and other forms of what we tend to call the welfare system in the U S right. Um, and the kind of causal inference side of things. So um, in that sense, quite a bit different. Um, yeah. Did, did she end up becoming a professor? Um, she has taught as an adjunct um, at various times, uh, at various places. But uh, she actually went into uh, into uh, like actual administration, like system. Oh, administration. oh okay, like okay. And so then, so then you also uh, your your dad. What did he do for a living? So my parents actually met in graduate school uh, huh. in, in political science, and so uh, he also has a political science PhD, um, and he was a professor for uh, quite a number of years at Southern Connecticut State uh, mm. University in New Haven, and um, then uh, sort of when he retired from that, did some nonprofit sector administration stuff, uh, which kind of he just got interested in for reasons that were not especially connected to his uh, work background. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, and he's they're, they're both basically retired now. But what's Stanford, Connecticut like when you're a kid? You know, I, I always think back and think it was a pretty boring place to grow up. Um, and I guess, you know, as a parent now, maybe I think that's not so bad, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, uh, but it was a, you know, suburb of New York City, a uh, little over 100,000 people. Um, I mean, not a, you know, immediate suburb, but lots of people would take the train into work there. Some people would drive um, decent number, I think, of uh, of. New York executives lived in the uh, kind of better off parts of Stanford. Um, Stanford kind of ran the gamut, um, economically speaking, from, uh, you know, desperate poverty in some areas to mm. uh, extreme wealth in others. Um, and, you know, I grew up in a uh, kind of a middle to upper middle class pocket. Um, I was sort of on the lower end of that at the time. Um, but, you know, I rode my bike around and my friend and I would, you know, in the summer we would go down to the mall and get into trouble and that sort of thing. And, yeah, uh, you know, I uh, the the baseball field I played Little League on was like across the street from my house until we moved and then it was down the street from my house. And so it was a pretty, you know, pretty uh, uh, kind of easy childhood in those regards. Yeah. Well, what music were you listening to in high school? Uh, I was always a, a big glam metal fan. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I frankly still am. In fact, lately, um, just just uh, last week or the week before I made this, for some reason, I decided I was going to make this uh, playlist of um, metal covers of non-metal songs. Um, and so I've <laughs> discovered some really great stuff, um, in particular, this fantastic cover of Antihero, you know, by Taylor Swift. Uh, uh, yeah. By this like Swedish band. Um, I don't even know how to pronounce their name. It's R E I N, like the beginning of reindeer. Yeah. Uh, capital X E E D. And it's, they have a cover of Total Eclipse of the Heart as well by Bonnie <laughs> Tyler. So it's like, you know, decades apart, but these guys are outrageous. Uh, and, uh, so I, I I just like, that's all I'm listening to now is is these metal covers. So oh, I, I got to remember to put that on the sub stack. I'll send it to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do that. Okay. Well, so like when you were a little kid, like maybe, um, you know, well, like when you were uh, maybe like middle school um, and if I had talked to your grade school teachers and I'd say, well, what's Jonah like? What's he like in class? What does he like? What does he dislike? Who does he play with? What would they have probably said? 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I think like many, uh, like many kids, I didn't have the greatest middle school experience. You know, there were kids who picked on me and I didn't get along with uh, the cool kids so much. Uh, but, you know, sort of towards the end, I, I, I had good friends and uh, that's kind of when I really started to get into music. I started playing mm-hmm. guitar when I was uh, 13, I think. Um, and um, so I was into baseball. I was into guitar. Uh, I was kind of into politics because my my parents would always talk to me about public policy issues and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so I had a kind of a, you know, the gamut of interests. In, in grade school, I actually don't, you know, I was a good student, um, but I, you know, I don't have like deep memories of the the grade school years so much. Uh, right, right. But I would say I was your basic awkward kid in middle school. What about high school? Had the, did the teachers start to see a different kid in high school? You know, I, I was uh, I, I was a real good student in high school. Um, you know, I there were other other kids in the, you know, I took all the AP classes and stuff. And there were other kids and we tended to be the same kids in, um, in those classes. Um, I also got through sort of various other reasons because I um, took, like I took, uh, I hated biology. And so I tested out of ninth grade biology somehow, even though I actually in retrospect realized I didn't actually, hadn't learned any of the things that were on the test, but I think they just decided like, this kid's going to be a pain in the ass. Let's just let him <laughs> out of it. Um, and uh, so I ended up in chemistry and the time schedule was such that I was in the like regular college prep chemistry, not the like honors one or whatever. Um, and so the uh, I had the full span of kids in that class. I was a freshman and they were, you know, everything from sophomores to seniors or whatever. And like, there was a kid from the football team who uh, I was like super intimidated by him, but he was kind of funny too. And uh, uh-huh. so, you know, I had the kind of range of kids I knew in, in high school. Like I said, Stanford run, ran the gamut in terms of like economic class and that right. was race and social class. And so I knew, you know, kids um, all up and down that in part because I took some stuff out of order. Right. Uh, And, uh, you know, but I think my teachers would have said I was, you know, I was kind of a nerdy, you know, uh, high grade getter, but I also was very into this like oppositional, like I'm a metalhead thing. And so, um, (laughs) you know, occasionally I would kind of get off the rails. Um, (coughs) Like one time um, we had this uh, assignment and I think it was sophomore year in English um, that we were supposed to make a collage about we were doing, I think it was archetypes, like hero archetypes and that sort of thing. And I mean, I knew better than this. This was purely to get in trouble, I think. Um, I made the collage by cutting up the pictures in the textbook. (laughs) 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 The the teacher loved the collage, you know, he presented in front of the class and she's like, oh, these are great pictures. These look so, you know, they really, (laughs) and then there's this pause and she's, wait a minute, I think I've seen these pictures. Did you cut up the textbook? And I was like, no. I had to buy a new textbook uh, <laughs> by the end of the year. Um, so I like I would do dumb stuff like that once in a while. But, yeah. um, you know, other than that, I think I wasn't that that unusual in high school. Well, so in in high school, you know, you're interested in politics, but you're also you, you've you got this like, you know, um, fun side or this like you got a lot of personality. Did, did you have any idea about like what you would want to do, what, would, what you kind of wanted your life to be about? Yeah, I thought I would maybe go into government or politics. Um, probably thought some about law. My my grandfather, my my mother's dad was a uh, was a lawyer, practicing lawyer mm. in uh, Long Island, New York. Um, and you know, both my parents being PhD political scientists, I sort of thought. I think I just sort of thought that's what I would do. Um, mm. You know, let's go get a PhD in something if I didn't do law. Um, right. My aunt, uh, my mother's sister, is a uh, has been in finance her whole. Uh, adult life. And um, and at some point she got me thinking about investment banking, but I, I don't think I really had any idea what that meant um, yeah. at the time. Um, so that was kind of, you know, I figured I'd go to college and for, for a while I was going to be a major league baseball player and that didn't pan out um, right around 13 or so. That wasn't going to happen. So, yeah. so you end up going to UMass Amherst. Uh, how, but you don't live in Massachusetts, right? So this is like you're in Connecticut, but you end up going to the state flagship in UMass. What what drew you there? So there was some push, some pull. So w- one aspect was that my uh, my stepbrother. So I my my parents split up when I was very young, um, and like like two is when I think I was two when they separated, and uh, I grew up mostly with my mom. 
Um, my dad lived in uh, New Haven and then Hamden, which is the next town over. So about an hour apart. Um, and uh, I have a stepbrother and a half, uh, step, sorry, stepbrother, a stepsister and a half sister from my dad's side um, who I grew up with. I also have twin half brothers. My mom had more kids later, but that's a different story. Mm -hmm. And um, my stepbrother at the time was going to UMass. He's, he's three or four years older than me. And um and he was going to UMass. And so I had applied there in part because he liked it. And my dad, uh, you know, sort of recommended the school, thought it was a it was a good school. Um, I applied sort of haphazardly. Uh, so I I thought I would go to Berkeley, actually. Um, and I applied and got into Berkeley. Um, I was all set to go there, um, but I got kind of cold feet. Mm. Um, it was the the night before the, you know, applications were due. And I was, um, I started young, not, I didn't skip a grade or anything, just like the way the calendar worked in Connecticut those days. And so I was 17 at the time. Uh, I guess I was still 16 when I was deciding, mm. uh, maybe just 17. And um, I just kind of was like, wow, California is so far away. And all the papers filled out, it was the night before the deadline. And I thought, I'm just going to go back up to UMass one more time to visit again. Um, mm. and so I, uh, it was funny, I got in the car, um, uh, I got on, sort of drove to the highway. It was like six o'clock in the morning. It was kind of dark. Um, and I'm on my way to the highway and I got the radio on and Led Zeppelin's going to California comes on the radio. Yeah. Um, and I thought, oh, wow, that's a sign, you know, uh, <laughs> I guess I'm going to California. And then I <laughs> got up to UMass and, um, and I, I had a great visit. Um, you know, I was kind of excited about my brother being there. Oh. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, but I also was kind of, flip, you know, kind of anxious about paying for um, for Berkeley because it was out of state tuition it was a lot yeah. more than uh, UMass is out of state tuition. And um, as I said, my parents got divorced when I was young and then get along so well. And um, who was going to pay what for college was kind of a flashpoint of disagreement, uh, as I recall. And I was just kind of I didn't want to. I just didn't want to listen to it and deal with it. And um, I remember calling Berkeley that day to find out if I'd gotten any merit aid. Um, and, uh, and the answer was either no, or, you know, we're going to tell you next week or something. And, yeah. um, but then I found out what the amounts were and it was small enough that I just thought, you know, I, I just got cold feet about the whole thing. It was like lots of little things. Right. And here I was where my brother was, and there was this kind of like built in connection. And, um, and I really liked it. I, I was in New England or pretty much my whole life. And yeah, uh, it just seemed like the easy route. And I think about that a lot. Like, was that the right decision or not? I got a really good education at UMass. Um, yeah. But, you know, Berkeley's a pretty great place, too. So, um, yeah. Yeah. The, um, I know those counterfactual questions are unanswerable. So they're, they right. can, but they can bug you a little bit. If we can do a synthetic control Jonah, right? <laughs> That's Find right. Out. We'll do that after the call. There you go. <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, so do you end up majoring in economics when you're at Amherst? You, you I did. Yeah, I majored any time. So what was minor. your, is a math minor. So what was your first encounter with it? Was it in UMass or was it in high school? With econ? You know, it's funny. I, I think I actually one summer when I was in high school, I took a Micro, there was a UConn, uh, University of Connecticut, Stanford branch. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, when I was very, er very early in high school, for some reason, my, uh, I don't know, it was my idea, my mom's, but I, I took a summer class in microeconomics at UConn, um, Stanford. And it, that was comical because I, I didn't understand any of it. You know, it's just <laughs> like this guy had this bunch of graphs. It was intro micro with all the average variable costs and total, right. average, you know, all that stuff. And I, I could do the math, you know, like I, I just kind of figured out that mathematically, this is what he's asking us to do. And I, I don't remember the grades or anything, but I think I got an A or something like that. And right. so I just kept making these graphs, you know, and but I had no idea what, it, you know, it was the worst kind of economics teaching. In that sense. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, well, he was, he was very French, this guy, he had a very thick French accent, kind of young, uh -huh. um, and to the point where he would talk about a table um, and he would call it a tableau. <laughs> <laughs> look at tableau one and i was like what is this guy doing so um that was probably my first experience with economics um and then my first class in econ at umass was i took a class called um uh it was like capitalism and democracy or something like that and just yeah. taught by sam bowles uh, ah, that's in my questions okay great 
Sam kind of became my mentor in a bunch of ways, but um, but that, I'm pretty sure that was the first class I took. I was at the, I think I was a poli sci major at the time when I switched. Ah, uh, huh. Yeah, so you a lot of people don't know this. UMass is got is just like a famous program in the history of economics for being just this long, illustrious in the for lack of a better word, that the heterodox tradition. And you don't hear about it very much. But um, did you notice when you were there there was something distinctive? I mean, you couldn't compare it to anything, but it must have been, you know, with your political background. I and mean, I can imagine it was kind of interesting in a way that you know, that, that original class wasn't, that original high school class was less <laughs> exciting. Yeah. So I was well aware of it. I mean, my, you know, when I was thinking about where to go to college, my dad was a big booster. He, he was sort of into um, radical political economy from, mm -hmm. as a, he wasn't an economist, but he was a reader, you know, he, he reads very widely in that kind of area. Um, and so I kind of was aware of the, the bent of the department. And um, I definitely was in that kind of radical lefty, um, political economy uh, tradition at the time. And so I, I loved it. I mean, I, it was, you know, it was totally my thing. I, I've, it's not at all the kind of economics I wound up doing. Yeah. Um, but I learned a lot of, uh, I, you know, I, I knew it was different. Um, I don't know if I could have articulated the ways and uh, the extent to which it was different until I got to grad school when I had all these, you know, classmates and friends who were economics majors at other places who, you know, hadn't taken you know lots of stuff I had taken but also had taken stuff lots of uh, lots of stuff that I hadn't taken so like yeah. you know the the kind of math angle I took some graduate classes that um at, at UMass that were kind of heavy game theory using classes and that sort of thing but mm. not with the like degree of formality that I think like a you know a kid who went to Berkeley or Harvard or MIT undergrad um and majored in econ at the time probably was getting, you know, at least in the upper level classes, something that wasn't too different from what they would see in, you know, first year micro. And, and right. it, most of that stuff was pretty new to me. So yeah. I, I, that was a big, a big difference. I think. Well, did you take any econ econometrics classes while you were there? Did they, did you, did they have that? I took some, uh, because I was a math uh, minor, I took a bunch of stats. Um, I didn't really I don't think I really, like I had had, you know, regression, not, not multivariate regression. Um, and then I took like a grad class or two at stats and like survey sampling. Mm -hmm. I really think I was clueless. Like, I, I, I don't think I knew I was just like, Oh, I better take this, you know, but I, I don't think I realized that it was not going to be particularly helpful in economics yeah. or stuff. Um, at least, you know, unless you became a heavily sampling oriented person, right. um, I didn't take econometrics. I, I don't think you're required to. Uh, mm. I, I guess you must not have been because I did get my degree. Um, um, but I do remember reading like Johnston before it was Johnston and DiNardo you mm. know, like, over the summer or something and just kind of realizing I was going to need to know this stuff. And so I and I had taken matrix algebra. So that, mm. that part wasn't, you know, wasn't a shock to me when I got to right. school. Right. Well, you said Sam Bowles was your, was, had, was sort of a mentor to you. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I I um I loved this class, the one I mentioned earlier that I took with him, and um, uh, and I I kind of was a, vaguely aware of who he was from talking to my dad, um, and you know, famously he and Herb Gintis, who I think um, uh, recently passed away, uh, I think I heard that uh, recently, um, um, but Herb I knew a little bit, um, but they they wrote all these like kind of classic, you know, lefty econ sort of Marxian radical political econ books, um. Uh, like one on schooling that was very famous uh, at the time called Schooling in Capitalist America. Mm -hmm. um, and Sam and both of them um, had taken this turn in this very kind of analytical direction. So they were very oriented toward um, kind of mathy uh, yeah. takes on, on, you know, sort of radical economics. And so it was this kind of interesting fusion of what I guess at the time might've been called Valrasian techniques or what they called new institutional economics. These days mm -hmm. we would just call, you know, game theory and, Right. And strategic thinking or whatever. Um, and so I was very drawn, I think, to the kind of the marriage of math and um, political theory and um, sort of like social policy thinking that um, that, you know, that Sam was really working on. And, um, you know, like many undergrads with their advisors, um, you know, I think I had this kind of like idolization thing as well. And, yeah. um, you know, poor Sam, I would, you know, show up as office hours all the time. And, um, I was like one of those, you know, puppies who follow around the, uh, <laughs> the, the parrot with the, with the dog food. Um, but, uh, I learned a ton from him. He was a great advisor. Yeah. 
Yeah. Did you think you might do something that was more theoretical when you go off to MIT? Was that kind of like bubbling in the back of your head the way they eat, the way he did? You know, it's funny. I, I think I thought when I started, um, when we, uh, the morning of graduation um, uh, from MIT, I rem- or, or like the last day of class or something or school before graduation, um, the year I finished. Um, sorry, that's my phone. Um, the, uh, uh, the chair of the department had uh, this, maybe this was a tradition. I don't know, but I went to my mailbox and back then you had a, like a physical mailbox, you know, in, in the department. And, and there was a, uh, uh, there was this piece of this, this, this like short uh, paper in it. And I took it out and I, and I thought, Oh my God, it was my statement of objectives. Like, you know, like the, my essay from when I applied. Right. Oh, and wow. They had put it for all of us who were graduating. And, um, and it was so funny to reread it. Right. Cause like I was, I was going to do international trade and I was going to do this and that I was gonna be a theorist. And like the mapping from that to what I actually did was, was I think about as like much of a right <laughs> angle as you could have, you know, <laughs> right. Um, total orthogonal. So, <laughs> right. Um, right. I, I don't know exactly what I thought, but I, I think I thought I would be, you know, sort of big theory, big think social. Yeah, theory yeah, yeah, guy, yeah. And that's not what ended up happening. Yeah, probably very much for the best. <laughs> right. So, so do you go immediately to MIT after you graduate from UMass? I did actually, and I'll I'll tell you a funny story. I, I don't want to use up all the time, but um, I uh, I was um. I, I had trouble getting in at first anyway to to grad schools. Um, mm. I hadn't applied to very many. I don't really know, you know, I, my, it's sort of like high school. I just didn't, I just picked this and that and it was sort of haphazard. And um, I, uh, I had, uh, you know, I'd done very well at UMass, but I had a couple of suspect math grades and I realized, you know, after the fact, that's just, that's just a killer. Even, even back then, Right. You know, these days, I guess if you don't have a tenorable file, you can't get into grad school. But, <laughs> um, but you know, back then, like a bad math grade would do it, right? And yeah, um, you know, first year of college, I just had a bad test or two, and um, and so it wasn't looking great. Um, and so I I, I want to go to Berkeley more than anything. Um, mm-hmm. I think because I just like kind of wanted to live there. I hadn't gone in the first place, and um, and uh, so I I didn't get in there, and um, I was waitlisted in Michigan. I was rejected by Harvard. Uh, UMass accepted me, not surprisingly, given uh, that they all knew me and I had done well there. Um, and uh, MIT hadn't yet given an answer. Um, and uh, but I knew because Sam, I guess, had called the director of admissions to mm. uh, find out what was going on. I knew what date they were going to make the decisions, and he basically had been told they're waiting on the NSF um, uh, uh, grad fellowship. Decision. Oh, you had applied for the NSF grad fellowship? Yeah, me and everybody else, right? Like you, you right. just were sort of told you should do that uh, if you're applying to become grad school. And so um, I, uh, the, the point of day came, you know, and um, it was, I think it was April 15th, uh, I, but um, it, whatever day it was, it was the day after the one uh, party that UMass funded for uh, students where there was alcohol surf. So for the graduating seniors, they would have this you know, it's not like the private colleges where they like ply you with all sorts. This was like, this is all you get. <laughs> and um, so it's this like big rager at the top of the campus, you know, the whole class is there's like a thousand people probably at this party, you know, <laughs> you drink too much, you go crash at your friend's dorm. And I lived in Northampton, which is about 10 miles up the road or five, I don't know, some number of miles up the road. And I take the bus back in the morning or however I got home and, and, um, and I was just like in a shambles, you know, just not, not well. And I thought, well, I might as well get this over with, like, you know, I feel bad already. Let's just kind of add to the, to the pain. Um, and so I call up the econ department um, and uh, the department secretary answers. Um, and I say, you know, I'm calling just to find out, uh, you know, the resolution, my application. And she says, okay, what's your name? And I say, Gail back. She's like, okay, hang on. And slight pause and she says and i'll never forget it's exactly the sentence says, you've been awarded an nsf fellowship so we've accepted you <laughs> <laughs> and you know i i was addled right and so there's a little bit of a delay and i said no gal back <laughs> and she, and she says she kind of takes her a second to figure she's she's like Okay, well, I've just looked at it and it, that's, it says that. And I said, G E L. And she finally starts laughing at me. She's like, no, really, you're like, you should go celebrate. You know, so um, you're like, I just celebrated last night. I can't celebrate. <laughs> that's right. 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 That's right.
so that was that was how I found out. Um, oh, that's great! What a great story! Wow, what did Sam say when you yeah, got in? Absolutely got it. Uh, he was happy. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, I don't remember exactly what he said, but uh, um, I don't. I think he was surprised as I was. Um, yeah. To be honest with you. Yeah. Well, so uh, so you graduate that spring. Do you have to do anything to kind of get ready? You have to do one of these boot camp things or something. Did they do that back then? Well, I signed up for the math boot camp um, just because I decided that would be a good idea. Uh, and then I kind of blew off most of the sessions and, you know, just hung out in Cambridge and Boston and acted like a 21 year old. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't get very much out of those those sessions. I did get to be friends with a few people who then, you know, were classmates. But yeah, um, yeah. I, I wish the, I had taken that more seriously. It would have it would have made my life easier as a grad student. So the math um, that you had, you could tell there was a big gap between the math that you got and what was expected of you when you got there? I mean, that's definitely the case now, yeah. but I was just wondering, has that gap gotten bigger or was it always, always there? You know, I, I it's a good question. I, I, you know, I haven't taught, like, I don't know what's going on in, in intro micro grad classes these days, but, you know, even then, you know, you would have like proofs of, you know, like proofs using real analysis or whatever. And, and I hadn't taken real analysis um so i had to pick that stuff up kind of on the fly uh right. so it was just more challenging than i think it would have been uh, yeah. for me I mean, I'd, there was one guy in my class who had been on stephen hawking's research team and stuff like that you know so you had a, some people who just it was like second nature and right uh, i had to learn a lot of stuff uh, as i went yeah 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 they had prelims back then we had uh what we called generals um and um i think we took them uh, after the second year. Yeah. So it was like, you know, these were your major fields. This was not like qualifying exams or something yeah. like that. And so uh, what year was it? It was like early nineties. I started in 93. So I graduated in college in 93 and started grad school in 93. Okay. Okay. And so who, who's making a big impression on you those first two years? Um, well, I was really, uh, I, I turned into like public econ became one of my fields. Um, and so I would say, you know, Jim Paterba was somebody I really um, looked up to. Uh, Peter Diamond, for sure. I still thought I wanted to be a theorist. Um, mm. and Peter was sort of like the consummate applied theorist working on like public policy questions through theory. Um, yeah. When I was there. Um, you know, Abhijit Banerjee was, you know, in, I don't know, second year, first year, something he had just started. Um, I took development from him and, um, uh, Kamas Piketty was, who was three months older than I was, was my, uh, professor. My first year. Piketty in was, wait, yeah. he was at, oh, so he's he had just started. Oh. He was at MIT for a couple of years before he went back to France. Huh. Uh, um, I didn't realize for some reason I thought y'all were kind of saying the same age, but no, we are. He's three months older than me, but, oh. um, he, uh, he, he had published his dissertation in jet when he was like 18. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> kids um, listening that's how you become professor at mit yeah he uh, was you know poor tomas right he was like the same age as a bunch of us and you, you, he was had to be younger than a good number of our class and you know you'd see him at at, at parties and stuff and you know he was very cool in french and you know he'd sit in the corner seat looking at <laughs> you know nice guy super good guy well so when do you get interested in econometrics does that uh, happen while you're there you know, I, um, <laughs> I, uh, well, I took the general exam in econometrics. Um, I made that one of my fields cause I'd already <laughs> taken the courses Yeah, <laughs> um, and I was lazy, I guess. Um, uh, so that was maybe part of it. Um, I, I was like the median, I think my friend Paul and I were like the dead on median, um, score in like linear econometrics. Um, and I, I thought of that was like the most perfect, like, you know, I couldn't even be superlatively bad, right? Um, <laughs> uh, and so I was, I just kind of didn't get it. And then um, nonlinear econometrics, which was taught by Whitney Newey, mm. uh, you know, who's like godlike, right? And um, mm. I, I I had trouble, I was very immature. I mean, I was 21 when I started and um, and um, I just had trouble focusing. And so I, I, at some point I stopped going to Newey's class um, and I thought, you know, I kept thinking I'm going to, I'm going to pick up all this material I'm going to study really hard I just won't go to class but I'll get the notes and of course I didn't go see do that and 
Oh, I'll cram the night before. And then my friend and I went to see Clerks the night before instead because it had just been released and everybody was going to see it. And then that morning I was like, shit, I'm in trouble now. And um, <laughs> and um, the one thing that was the saving grace was it was open book. Um, and um, I took, I had taken like 12 different books on nonlinear econometrics out of the like Dewey library, which is like the, in the building next to the econ department. Um, and so I showed up for the exam and I had partly been hardened because the TA who was um, Jack Porter is a really great econometrician. Um, Jack had uh, had like a review session where he did the prior several years final exams or something. And each question he did in five minutes and like on the book. And I was like, okay, well, Jack's a lot smarter than me, but you get 180 minutes and there will only be like two or three questions. So I don't know if he's 20 times smarter, you know, so I thought, you know, maybe I can manage this and have all my books. Um, and I showed up for the exam with these like stacks of books next to me. I don't even know. I must have had like a suitcase or something. to bring them. <laughs> and um, here comes the exam and it was three hours long. It's right before uh, Christmas break. And uh, a lot of people left early and, you know, um, sort of they did well. And um, but I just kind of sat there and during that exam, you know, I would like, there'd be a question and I'd try and figure out what to look up in which index of which book. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of figured out that class during that, like it, because it turns out like nonlinear econometrics is just a bunch of central limit theory. And it, once mm -hmm. you can kind of figure out that that's what it's about, then every problem becomes about how do I get things into like a normal vector and like, you just got to know what's a chi squared. And there is like a very small number of tricks that if you if you really figure them out, you can answer anything, at least that you could then at, in terms of an exam level thing, like in terms of what's going on in the, you know, advanced econometric realm these days, it's a different story. But, um, and somehow I just kind of, and I, I kind of walked away from that exam. I did well on the exam and I, I walked away thinking like, huh, maybe this is like a good fit for me. Mm. <laughs> um, and um, Was that and a good I, feeling on that test? Feeling like you figured something out like that? that yeah, you it was. I mean, I I really had the fear of God in me going into that. Like I, you know, not, not enough to like actually be prepared or anything, but, um, you know, I, I really was like freaking out going in and it felt good to be able to kind of find, but more than a grade, like the, just now I understand this, like I, that makes sense to me. That was the thing that really made a difference. And right. then when I got into doing applied work um, and I sort of through, I wound up working with Josh Engrist um, uh, cause I was going to work with John Gruber and then he became assistant deputy treasury secretary or something that in the relevant year. Um, you know, Josh is kind of like a very econometric -y, empirical guy and, um, and it just kind of fit together for me, like the mm. doing the data work, the coding, and the econometrics. Um, it took me a few years, even after grad school, I think, to finally kind of have a cemented sense of what my identity was in that regard. Mm. But um, mm. it really, it really fit for me, and I think that that three-hour exam was kind of like the beginning of my realizing that. Mm. Were there guys like that back then? The you know, I think like there are like applied econometricians more these days, but. Was there like when you were in graduate school it's, or was there more of like a pure set segmentation? Like, you know, you're an empirical guy, but you're not actually like creating econometrics per se. I, well, it's funny. I think actually in a sense, it, it, things sort of started earlier in the other direction. Like, I think I could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure like Havelmo was actually like mm. doing stuff with data, you know, and right. Klein and you know, th these people who really kind of created like the, the whole Coles Commission thing was, you know, was sort of like econometric theory because we care about applying those tools directly to data. Right. Or look like a, Heck, you know, like a Heckman, you know, now these yeah, people totally. are very technically right. adept. Yeah. And I take your question to be like, okay, but is there sort of this middleware part, this like layer of people who are sort of doing methods and creating new stuff, but not necessarily frontiers at the moment, right? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's not quite those people, right? They were the frontiers at their time. Right. But, you know, like my classmate, the, uh, a, a classmate of mine, this guy, Jeff Kling, was like a really, really good applied econometrician. And, you know, I, I don't know if he's like created new estimators or whatever, but, he, you mm -hmm. know, he's the kind of person who could, you know, you'd go to him for advice about stuff or... Right. Um, uh, you know, like uh, Sendo Melanathan and Marianne Bertrand and Esther yeah. Dufo have the famous cluster paper, right? Like right. they were contemporaries of mine. Esther at MIT was a year, uh, start of the year after me. We 
um, and then, you know, Sandal and Marianne were at Harvard and graduated the same year as me. And, um, and, you know, they were, they were working on that paper when we were all grad students. If, if oh, wow. And, yeah. So like, I don't know that there, there were people doing stuff like that. Um, right. I think labor was kind of where it was at at the time. Mm. Mm. Wait, so you work with Angrist while you're in, while you're at MIT? Is he your advisor? Yeah, he was my advisor. He was my dissertation chair. Um, and sort of by default, I never actually took labor. Uh, like I've uh -huh. never taken labor economics, but Josh, um, uh, because John Gruber was away, he kind of said, you should go talk to Josh. And, um, and you know, that, so Josh became my advisor. Um, mm -hmm. Very generously, actually, I realized in, in retrospect, like he could have said no, <laughs> but. Right, 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 right. So you approach Gruber because of that interest in public type questions, but do you end up changing your, topic when you work with Angers? Yeah. So what really happened is I started, I want to work with Peter Diamond. Um, and Peter, I think mostly correctly thought I was a lousy theorist. Um, and uh, and clearly like he he would humor me, but I, I don't think he enjoyed being my advisor. And after a while I got the hint enough to to move on. Um, and this the the sort of embarrassing part is that uh, Jim Paterba had sort of signaled pretty strongly to me that you know he would be glad for me to be his student. And you know, both because Jim is an amazing um, advisor and somebody you can learn an enormous amount from, and because he had a record of placing people really well, like that was just an incredibly dumb thing not to, not to say two thumbs up, great. Uh, <laughs> but I wanted to go work on theory and I kept mentioning all these theory topic, topics and he said, go talk to Peter. Um, and I probably could have gone back to Jim, um, but um, I just wasn't real sure what I wanted to do. And, and I got this one idea that ultimately turned into um, my job market paper. Um, and I was at that point had been talking to John Gruber and he was like super encouraging and like, this is great. And, um, just really like, you know, what you want your advisor to do as a grad student, which yeah. felt a little alien to me after having worked with Peter. Uh -huh. um, I, I didn't have that experience. Um, I mean, I, I, we were just probably a bad match. I think he can be a great advisor for, for the right person. Um, yeah. and, um, and so I, I, uh, I, I thought, oh, this is going to be great with John. <laughs> I gave this labor lunch uh, or public lunch and um, and he was like super encouraging. And just at the end of the conversation after he's like, this can be your job market paper. It's going to go great. He said, but by the way, I can't be your advisor because I'm going to Washington next year. Um, <laughs> and uh, so go talk to Josh. And I knew who Josh was, but I hadn't, like I said, I hadn't taken labor. So it was yeah. a little bit trial by fire for me. Well, why do you think he recommended Angers? I think Josh was just the guy who was taking John's runoff. <laughs> I don't think it was like a, a Jonah effect. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what was he like as an advisor? What'd you get? What do you think? What do you think that, uh, how do you think you're different as a result of working with Josh? Or maybe you would, maybe you would have always been the same. Josh really pushed me um, in a bunch of ways. And um, I think like he, you know, working with him forced me to, to like really think about stuff harder than I otherwise would have and to like mm -hmm. really get into details and understand the econometrics of what I was doing at much mm -hmm. more than the kind of like at that point textbook level. I mean, so much of the stuff that Josh pushed me to think about is now the textbook stuff because of right. Josh. Right, um, right, right. Uh, but Josh also, you know, he, he could be, you know, he could be... A, partly because he was so demanding, but also I think it's kind of his, his style is to sort of like, no matter what you say, uh, what, what you do in the first draft, he's going to tell you, you know, this is a great start, except for all the ways in which it's horrible. And it really, I mean, I think you could, it doesn't, it could be an econometric or paper. I think he's just going to say that, right. uh, or at least back then. And, um, and so I, that was like a, I, I, I recoiled against like Josh's kind of like, I'm going to push you Thing mm -hmm. for a while and and so I, I it was it was not an easy match for me but by the time I graduated I realized I had learned a ton from him and mm -hmm. um and even more had that realization you know within a year or two of having left um, mm -hmm. you know I'm, I'm a far better econometrician and thinker um for having had uh had Josh as an advisor um mm -hmm. I wish I had taken labor with him you know so so um uh you end up going to Maryland. What was your job market paper again? You mentioned it, but I, for, I forgot what you said. Uh, my job market paper was um, uh, public schooling. And um, I'm going to forget the title of it, but it, it was a um, about the effect of free public schooling on maternal labor supply. Oh. Uh, so I used the quarter birth of a five-year-old looking only at kids who were five as an instrument for uh, whether they enrolled in- You say uh, public, public high school? No, free public- Public kindergarten, essentially. Public kindergarten. Yeah. Oh, like a like a proto, 
Wait, so how far back was that? That's like a, that's not Head Start. It's something else. Um, no, so this is this was like just just kindergarten, just you know. So looking at five year olds. Oh, and, just looking at kindergarten. Got it. Right. So what I what I took what I did was I took the 1980 census. You couldn't do this with the 90 census, which I uh -huh. so this, the 90 census was 10 years old. I could have in principle done it, but the 90 census didn't have anything about um, month of birth or or quarter of birth or anything like that. Um, but kids who are born, you know, just before the cutoff for starting school when they're five start earlier and kids who are born just after it typically don't start um, uh, uh, kindergarten until they're six. Um, and so is you this have, like an R, are you doing like an RD? Well, ideally it would have been an RD, right? If I had day of birth um, uh, that I would have been able to do that. But all I had from the 80 census was quarter of birth. And so oh, quarter, yeah. Yeah. So it really was like, if you think about Angers and Kruger's papers on yeah. quarter birth and, and schooling uh, uh, attainment, this was at the other end of the child life cycle. So the yeah. early end, yeah. you know, when they start school rather than how much schooling they get. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, but it was a much more powerful first stage. And this was the time when all the kind of pushback was happening against weak instruments. And, you know, that really, a lot of that came from the Angers and Kruger yeah. Uh, work because their first stage was so weak. Um, right. So a ton of econometrics developed over that issue. My situation was, and I, I had to learn all that stuff in order to kind of defend what I was doing on the job market. Yeah. yeah. But my situation was not like it at all because it turns out like whether your five-year-old is enrolled in public school is like extremely highly associated with uh, whether that kid was born in which quarter uh, of the, the calendar year. Um, because you just can't enroll the kid in public school and you know if they if they were born after the cutoff and they're not doing the thing where they red shirt them back then or whatever it is some people did right and that was an issue right is like you know the, the red shirting is like you know you you, you that's the kind of endogenous choice you that's don't the want to just look that's at it right exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. that's one of the reasons why you needed to do IV. yeah so wait are you doing like the three dummies quarter of right. birth exactly you kept you kept the three you still doing all the like the, the 180 interactions. Well, because I, I was only looking at one cohort of children's worth of age, right? So I basically I restricted my sample to women who had a five-year-old child. And then oh. the question was, which of the four quarters was that child born in? Whereas Angerson Kruger stuff is using everybody. Cohorts oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. So what do you find? I find that um, being able to enroll your kid in public school leads to a lot more uh, labor supply, a lot less welfare participation, um, mm. you know, a lot less uh, cash assistance receipt. Um, and uh, it's kind of, there been, there'd been a sort of small but developed literature on um, kind of measuring the effect of childcare costs from the point, like structural work, largely, from yeah. the perspective of trying to answer the question, well, what if we gave an X percent subsidy to, you know, to... Uh, uh, to the parents of, of young kids in terms of, um, you know, X dollars an hour or X percent of the cost of, um, of child care. And um, that literature was a little bit of a kind of all over the place literature. There's a, it's a very, very hard problem because you have a dual selection issue. Mm. You have both the question of who's working, right? Yeah. Um, like who's working for pay um, and the question of who's enrolling their kid in child care or school, right? Yeah. So, there are selection, so there was a bunch of like kind of fancy looking econometrics or, you know, dual, you know, endogenous, dual endogenous probits and um, sort of very Hecate style stuff. Yeah. Um, and my paper was, there was one other paper by uh, Dan Black and Mark Berger that had used uh, waiting lists um, in Kentucky. They were both at the time at, on the uh, Kentucky econ faculty. And mm -hmm. they had this great idea. They went and got the wait list um, for a state free childcare program and they um, they just kind of compared the labor supply of those who were on the wait list versus those who are, who got the subsidy, got right. access. But I was able to actually just look directly in a very kind of, you know, post that era um, IV kind of natural experiment kind of way. And I, I got lucky in that that's what where everybody was moving um, mm. kind of methodologically and everybody could understand the identification and the idea and um, it had like, you know, potentially important public policy implications and mm, uh, mm. it was a cleaner answer in some ways, although I think also messier in that it was very reduced form. Right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's very cool. Where'd you end up publishing that? Uh, that paper made it to the AER. 
I saw that one. Okay. I didn't know that was your job market paper. Yeah. Wow. It's so because well, would... I was on the market in, in 98. Um, I graduated in 98. So it was 97, 98. Mm. Uh, that job market year and but the paper was not actually formally published until two it was accepted mm. you know, a couple of, mm. i sent it as soon as i got to maryland basically but wow. it just took a while to work its way through oh that's con- that's great so that must have been really what a satisfying experience just from start to finish on that it was pretty great it was yeah pretty just great. feeling like you learned something um uh so you go to maryland you end up getting so i wrote here this thing i was just kind of now i feel like it's all kind of coming together a little bit but um, you know, it, it, when I looked at your Vita and your career, it's like, I, or I kind of had, I, I know, I know you, I know you a little bit more than just the average person. Um, you know, there's like this distinctive, you know, you're an econometrician and you're like writing, you know, your two most cited papers are on clustering with Cameron and Miller. It's like 8,000 sites, you know, total. And then you've also got this like other work on, public finance style questions on poverty and large government programs with, with uh, Hillary Hoynes and Marion Bittler. And so, you know, it goes back to this conversation we were having, which was you've, you've been these two people, right. And in time you become like a third person when you become a lawyer. And so I was just kind of curious, you know, what does it feel like you're two people or does that, is that actually, you know, in your world, just super seamless? Um, I think that's a good question. I mean, I, you know, it's, it was organic in the sense that, you know, I, I got interested in the, I was always interested in uh, poverty assistance and public programs just because I was interested in like, you know, social policy and making the world better and reducing poverty. And, um, you know, those are things I've always cared a lot about. Um, but the econometrics stuff really kind of developed for me in the process of thinking about the questions I was working on. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, then I, I, at some point I just kind of became more econometrics oriented. Like I just got interested in econometrics questions and I would just read a lot of econometrics for its own sake. And then, you know, that sort of took on its own, uh, its own life, but like thinking about clustering, for example, you know, that was like stuff I cared about in the context of papers I was working on that mm. were, that were definitely empirical papers. Um, and actually it's a funny story. The, the way I, um, got hooked up with, uh, with Colin and, uh, and Doug, I knew Doug, um, from, uh, from around, basically we overlapped some in a, in the, uh, Robert Wood Johnson, uh, scholars in the health policy program at Berkeley. And, um, so that was part of it. Um, but uh, what happened was um, Colin and Doug, unbeknownst to me, were working on this issue that became our um, uh, multi uh, multiple clusters paper, not the bootstrap one, but the oh. uh, multiple overlapping uh, clustering um, paper, um, and uh, which is the uh, JBES one, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... Um, I got to think about that question because one day, um, this is when I was still at Maryland. Uh, so for people who don't know, Maryland is inside the Beltway. So you basically like it's DC for all practical purposes. Mm-hmm. But I lived in DC um, and I'd gotten called for jury duty. Um, and, uh, you know, jury duty, at least back then, and it's still that way in lots of big cities, I think, you know, you you would go in, there's a big room, you have to sit there all day. Um, you might or might not get called on a panel. Um, even if you do, you're probably not gonna end up on a jury for a variety of reasons. So you just kind of, and there was no Wi-Fi or anything like that uh, in the building back then. So you had to have reading material and work to do. Right. And I had this book that I had bought, like one of those Dover math collection books, you know, the like the little yeah. ones that are, they're like out of copyright. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. you can get them for like six bucks or whatever, because they've just copied whatever some famous person wrote 70 years ago or whatever, right. um, and then republished it. And uh, I just like in a hurry, grabbed this book. It was called like uh, uh, Discrete, it was like on discrete math and, um, but it's a short, short book. And I'm sitting there and I'm reading the section. I'm like waiting to be called or let go. Um, and I'm reading the section on um, counting rules the inc- and there's this inclusion exclusion rule. Um, and it's like, how do you count the number of elements uh, uh, in a set that are in multiple categories? And like, it, it basically is the exact math of one of the approaches in our 
uh, multiple clusters paper, the, the approach that says cluster on one variable, cluster on the other, add the matrices together, and then subtract the result of clustering on both of them, like the cluster one and two. Uh, mm -hmm. not one one comma two and it's just a counting rule um like set from set theoretic discrete math and i never took a class in any of that stuff but i was like oh that's kind of interesting and i sort of saw somehow i just had this like moment of inspiration of the connection between the two and so i thought well geez i'm going to start working on this and i wrote something up and i mentioned it to hillary points um who at the time was at uc davis it, mm -hmm. uh, and was so was a colleague of uh, of collins and doug had just started there right uh, and um, and so Hillary mentions to Colin and Doug uh, that I had told her something about this crazy thought I had. And um, this was exactly what they were working on. So Doug got in touch with me and we ended up joining forces. Um, they, they had a different angle on the same problem. So the paper ends up talking about both those angles and how they lead you to the same result. Oh, um, interesting. So that's how I got interested in that and, and, and got involved in that. And then while we were working on that, uh, I was interested in bootstrap stuff because of some other paper I was working on um, and uh, got this idea about do, dealing with the what happens when you have a small number of clusters. The, I think the Colin was the one who saw the um, refinement point there. Um, uh, uh, or maybe I saw the refinement and Colin had the idea about the using the wild bootstrap. I forget which, but yeah. uh, it was just a very fruitful collaboration. Um, yeah, yeah. You and know, Doug was coming up for tenure fairly soon, and so he worked his ass off doing um, the, um, like coding up the. I mean, it was a, we we're all full partners in the project, but Doug did this just insane amount of coding to like make all the Monte Carlos go. So that project went quickly. Oh, that's that's cool. You know, it's like um, I feel like I'm much more typical of an applied person than when I listen to you because. I, I really love econometrics. I love learn, I love reading your work or reading Doug's work, for instance, or something like that. But it's like I, my creativity really does not come in spotting those kinds of opportunities, you know? And I just was wondering, you know, if you had to compare yourself with like maybe other applied people that you can just like, whoever that would be, what is the different creative, you know, X factor that like an, an econometrician has from someone that just uses econometrics, like a consumer versus a producer. What, what exactly, because they could both be very creative people, but like, what's the, what's your thing? You know, that's a really great question. I don't think I have a good answer. Um, you know, I, I just kind of get interested in stuff and, you know, I've been fortunate that the things I get interested, I mean, yeah. I'll tell you, you know, like I had a thing I got interested in uh, that I was interested in for a number of years had to do with dealing with small numbers of uh, clusters where you have like really imbalanced panel sizes um, mm -hmm. and which there's some kind of interesting problems out there about that kind of situation. And um, and I, I thought I had a solution and I, I torched a summer and a half working on it. And, um, you know, my thing works in theory, but not at all in practice. And um so, uh, you know, I just want to be clear, like, it's not like you just have an idea and then they all work out great. Um, right, right. Some right. of them work out that there goes your summer, you know, it's like, I have to write an activity. What did I do all summer while I fished in a dry hole? Right. I mean, um, <laughs> but I worked really hard. Right. I mean, right, you know? right. Right. But, you know, for the most part, the things anyway that are that have been successful, I got interested in a question um, yeah. and, um, you know, through happenstance. I either figured out a solution or I got to talking to somebody else who, you know, pushed me in the direction of thinking about something that turned out to be a solution. So in the latter example, I have this paper, when do covariates matter uh, and which ones and how much, uh, which is mm. like a T comp style paper that just leverages the omitted variables bias formula. How that paper actually happened is that paper was published in 2016. I started working on the issues, not, not realizing it. Um, I started working on the issues that became that paper in the summer of 1998. Um, mm. So I was working on, getting my job talk paper, the one we talked about earlier, ready to publish in the AR, um, yeah. well, first to submit. And then after I had gotten um, reports and stuff and, you know, kind of addressing some of the uh, concerns. And Josh always pushed me to think about like, you know, well, what happens to your key results when you add Xs, right? So right. Z is where the identification is coming from, right? The instrument. But what happens when you add more Xs? Like how robust are the results? And and, you know, I, everybody knew what the intuition there was, which is, well, if the new X's are correlated with the Z's, then 
you know, it's just going to move your results around. And then you'll, so if the results move, understanding that there's a bit of a fallacy of the contrapositive there, but, but in general, if the results do move, when you keep adding the, you know, more X's, then that's probably a reason to think that maybe the instruments aren't so great. Maybe they're okay. Yeah. Conditional on all the X's, but you got to make that argument. Yeah. 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 That's a harder argument, right. Right. Um, to convince people of. And so I was doing all that and, and I just wanted like a citation that I could point to. Right. That, like I'm doing this for this reason. See, you know, whoever and that guy, uh, right. you know, 19, whatever. And um, I couldn't find it. Yeah. Um, and the stuff that I could find that was close to it was like really older stuff. And so I, I would like write to these old stats guys. And, you know, these were, you know, one guy in particular, I think was about to retire. And like, he wrote back and it's like, oh, you know, see my paper. But that was the paper that made me think to write that guy. And it didn't address yeah. the issue. Right, right, so right. I got to, sorry, say again? No, no, yeah, I'm following you, yeah. So I got to thinking about it and, um, and I, and I kind of worked out the math of, okay, how, here's how you would think about it. And I realized it's just a Hausman test, but it's a Hausman test for a different reason from the premise of Hausman's theorem. Uh, and that struck me as kind of interesting. And so I bookmarked it. Um, and, uh, you know, for like the next time I have the next thing I want to work on. And um, actually, a few years later, when I was out in Berkeley doing this scholars and health policy program, I was going back to Maryland for like a week. Um, and I wanted to be able to tell my I was on tenure, you know, and I wanted to be able to tell my department chair what I had achieved. Um, and so uh, I uh, pulled an all nighter and wrote the because the answer was not much um, at, at, on that particular day. Um, <laughs> and so I wrote the like skeleton of what was going to be this paper um, so I could then show up and wave this in front of him. And um, that version of it didn't really go very far. And I kind of put it aside. I kept putting it aside. And one day, um, a couple of years later, I was giving a talk, maybe the next year I was giving a talk um, at Berkeley and David Card was, um, who's just been tremendously wonderful to me throughout my career, as long as I've known him for mm. no reason other than he's like the best person in the universe. Um, mm. Like I wasn't his student, you know, I wasn't his colleague. Um, he was my formal mentor in this Robert Wood Johnson program at Berkeley. And he was in, uh, we got to talking about this issue and this Hausman test thing. And the first thing was he he was like, that's not a Hausman test because the premise is wrong. And I said, well, the premise is wrong, but it's the same math and here's why. And I, I have so much respect for David. He wrote back and he was like, yeah, you're right. But the, I don't know, somehow my sense of like people like David is that they, they wouldn't just say, yeah, you're right, but he did. And he kept kind of pushing me um, and said, well, have you thought about doing like some kind of forensic decomposition of like what is going on in all this? Mm -hmm. um, and I hadn't thought about that too much. And he had this idea that was like 98% of the way there. And I thought about it and I figured out the last 2%. And that became the omitted variables bias decomp, which is, I think that paper is now like my third or fourth most cited paper. Mm -hmm. um, and it gets cited a lot. So it will be, you know, third after the two you mentioned earlier, pretty soon. Right. And, um, and like, I just got, you know, it took me six, 18 years to publish that paper mm. uh, because I always had something else to work on, but I was always thinking about it a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, and I, so like, that's kind of, to answer your question, a very long winded way of doing it. I just get interested in things. You just get interested and, in it. You know, so maybe it's not as right? different. I mean, maybe it's. I, yeah, right. I mean, I think when you get interested in your things and I get interested in yeah. mine, they're just yeah. not the things. Right, um, right, right. So you end up, getting tenure at Maryland, you go to your Arizona and then you're at Arizona for three years. And then you take a very uncommon, uh, make a very uncommon choice. You leave academia to go get a JD at Yale. What, what is that story about? It's not that that's, it's not that it's uncommon to get a JD PhD today. Um, our friend Andrew Baker has one, but, um, it just seems like a lot of people do it at the same time. And your your decision to do it seems like there's a story there. So the joke I like to tell people, and I used to tell it at the time, and they'd say, why are you? I'd say, I don't want to be department chair. Because, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a rotating thing in econ departments mostly. And um, I, I was coming up soon, I think. Um, but uh, but that really is a joke. Like I, you know, uh, uh, I the, the short version of the story is I'd always been interested in law. Yeah. Um, yeah, it waxed and waned for me how interested I was, but it was, uh, it was waxing more than waning by a lot, um, uh, over a period of several years. Um, I guess it kind of rekindled for me after nine 11 with, um, mm. you know, I felt like the, the security state responses were terrible. And I, I thought, oh, I'm going to go, uh, uh, 
I'm going to, I'm going to quit and go to law school and go litigate constitutional cases. And at some point, somebody, probably my father kind of got through to me and was like, you know, it, this isn't like you just win because you're smarter. Like there's a lot of smart lawyers out there yeah. already saying exactly what you would say. And like, you know, if you want to do it, that's fine, but don't, don't delude yourself into thinking that like you're, you're going to change what would have otherwise happened, you know? Right. Um, and I don't know, maybe that's the wrong way to, maybe that's like a dejection factory. Um, you should like encourage people to follow their dreams or something, but it, it did give me pause. And I thought, uh, I thought about it for a long time. I went back to doing my econ stuff. And um, what I realized was I just was really, the questions I was most interested in um, were law questions. I was reading, you know, legal scholarship, mostly on constitutional interpretation. Mm. I was reading law blogs. Um, you know, I was reading books on law. And, you know, I, I realized now how little I knew of the predicate stuff. So like, yeah. I thought I knew a lot more than I really did, but I was just really interested. And I just really couldn't shake that. Um and um, then I, my wife and I had our uh, our, our first kid. Um, so this was like my second year, I think, at Arizona. Uh, I was only there three years, and and um, and he, uh, I just realized, you know, our, our, after our son was born, like, um, you know, he's going to turn five, and then we're not going to want to like just move around, and you know, yeah, if I, if we're going to make changes, you know, if we're going to move, like, we better do it sooner rather than later, and. Um, God bless her. My, my wife was delirious from breastfeeding and, and everything else that goes along with being a new mom. And, um, and I said, you know, I, I've been thinking about it again. And I think I want to go to law school after all. I was just like, okay, great, let's do it. And, um, uh, uh you know, I mean, it was a long drawn out decision, um, process, but I think some of it was just, we were just kind of adult, um, you know, and, uh, and so doing a, kind of crazy thing didn't seem as crazy to us as mm. it might have been an, under different circumstances but I, I was really excited about law and I knew a lot of people by that point who were doing law and econ stuff and I'd done a fair amount of market research and I, I had the strong sense that it was unlikely that I was gonna you know end up in in dire straits professionally um mm. and uh, and I just kind of I was just really really excited about it and I wasn't out of econ ideas so I figured if it went poorly, I would just, you know, I'd take whatever job I could get to get back in the econ uh, academia world and and hopefully work my way back up if if need be, and otherwise just be wherever I was. And yeah, um, you know, that's not what ended up happening. But um, but yeah, it was mostly, you know, I just got really, I had been interested in law for a long time, and it was yeah. just kind of a dream. I decided to follow it at sort of the what felt like probably wrongly, but the the last moment when I could have, you know. Right, right, right. I mean, in some ways, when you look at your your working papers, they they still feel like econometric. You're still an econometrician. I was just like power and statistical significance and securities fraud litigation, Bayesian approach to event studies for securities litigation. I mean, I can definitely see that it's that it's a fusion, but you know, you're still this econometrician within law. Did you know that there was a demand for that kind of empirical methodologist within law when you decided to go to Yale? Well, I think there were, you know, I knew a lot of people who were empirical econ types and, and some who were empirical types who weren't econ, like maybe they were trained in poli sci or what have you, um, you know, in law schools. And so I knew that this, I had visited for a year at Florida State's law school. And so I gotten to know some people there, a um, guy who became a good friend and colleague for a while, John Click, uh, who who then left Florida State later uh, for Penn and uh, the law school. Um, and uh, we, we were co-authors on one of the, some of the work you're talking about. So I kind of knew that there was this world, you know, the, the law and finance world um, has a ton of empirical stuff. And some of these papers, you know, they could be published in uh, in the journal of you know one of the like finance journals or yeah. corporate finance related stuff. So I knew that there was a you know that there was a market for that sort of thing. I um, I I wasn't sure how much I was going to do like that stuff versus just law stuff, right? Um, but I was open to to that possibility. And you're you're right that I, a bunch of my work has been particularly the stuff on securities um, litigation has been econometrics. Um, stuff. I have other work that's much more kind of down the line, you know, civil procedure or yeah. uh, evidence law. But um, but even the evidence law stuff has a pretty big uh, stats bent to it methodologically. This feels like a better fit. This feels more like you being in a law school than being in an econ department. 
Yeah, I really like it. I mean, I think I, I think at an earlier moment in my career, it might have not been the right thing. Um, yeah. I, one, one thing I'll say is having been in an econ department and, you know, at, at good econ departments and having gotten tenure, um, you know, I, I, I don't I think some people when they're in a field like law and they're a law and person. So they have a degree from you know, poli sci or econ or whatever other field. So um, philosophy sometimes, you know, um, they're. I think it's less about the people themselves, but there's this perception that people in law schools sometimes have about the JD PhD havers, which is like, oh, well, they're only doing this because they couldn't have succeeded in their home discipline. Oh, uh, uh -huh. and I, I think that that's like a corrosive attitude, but you do see it mm. um, from a lot of people. It's sort of less so now, I think, because so many people now, yeah, these faculties now are joint degree people, right? Um, but I just never feel any kind of sense about that because I had a career I was happy with yeah, totally. um, first in, in econ. I do, to, to, to answer the flip side of it, though, the, the sort of more positive side, it does feel the, like the right fit for me. You know, I can publish in peer-reviewed journals when I want to and when I have the right ideas for those things. And mm -hmm. um, and I'm still, you know, at least back when I was active on Twitter, I was still lots in touch with econ people. And now I try to stay in touch in other ways. But um, so I still get to kind of satisfy that part of my like intellectual palette. Um uh, but I also get to do all the stuff that I find really, really interesting about law and, and legal policy. And, um, and I really love teaching law uh, more mm. than I liked teaching economics. Um, What's different? You know, um, I, I don't think I was a great dissertation advisor. Um, I, like I, I maybe I would be better now because I think a lot of it was I was just poorly organized mm. um, in terms of time management. And a lot of, I think, good advising is about creating structure for your students um, and helping them do that for themselves. And I was really bad at it for myself. So uh, not surprisingly, right. not great at helping them with that. Um, and, and I, it, you know, it just didn't excite me the way um, the way it does for some people. Um, yeah. It's not, nothing against the students I had. They were great. It just, um, it just, I, I didn't feel like I, it was like the right fit for me. Right. Um, law teaching I really like because the style of it is, um, it's sort of more, at least in my experience, it's more engaged. Um, yeah. and it's a broader template of, uh, of of topics within the field that you're teaching. Mm -hmm. At least it feels that way to me. Um, you know, you meet a much broader array of uh, students. Uh, law is just so much more generalist in terms of whom it attracts. You get some, you know, techie mathed up people. You also get like folks who are totally from the humanities or philosophy. And so it's just a sort of more general kind of, um, crowd. Uh, and and uh, again, maybe when I was, you know, in my 20s and, and an econ professor, early 30s, I might not have liked that as much as I do now, but I, it yeah. feels like the right fit for me. Yeah. Uh, That's awesome. Well, let me, let me kind of just end with this, this question here. Um, uh, I asked Susan Athey a question. I was like, well, what's your favorite X, Y, Z. And she said, well, that's, you, that's, a, you can't ask that question because it's too hard. So you have to say, you know, what's something you like? So I'm going to change that. I said, what's a, what's an article or a book in econ or law or econometrics? You get to just pick that you've noticed uh, kind of lives in your head, as they say on TikTok, lives in your head rent free. You just notice that it just kind of has hung around in your head may not be your favorite may not yeah, be yeah. the most important thing, but you just find yourself thinking about it. That's a great question. I mean, um, I think that it varies a lot with what I'm thinking about at any given day um, topically, but I would say in the econ world um, in part because of my work on, um, on distributional like uh, treatment effects um, uh -huh. papers with um, Bittler and Hoynes um, this paper by Heckman Smith and Clements um, mm. uh, uh, it's just a um, fabulous paper. It's a restud paper. Um, and it, it just got me thinking about things in a way that I hadn't thought of um, before. Um, so mm -hmm. that's a, that's a great example. Um, uh, I feel like, well, I mean the late paper, right. By Angrest yeah. uh, and Inman's like, it was so generative of so much. And like, you know, you can just always go back to it and get some new insight um, yeah. or see how it is, you know, uh, how it's affected um, things. I, I could probably go on and on and on about econ papers, but th those are a couple. Um, on the law side, um, so econometrics, Woldridge's textbook, like the, mm. 
Um, I think it's in a later edition now, but the last one I taught from was the first edition, the 2002 cross yeah. section. Um, the big book, the graduate yeah. book. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just a, a tour de force, an amazing yep. book. Like, mm -hmm. Go back to it all the time. Um, uh, on the law side, um, I think, so I, uh, I teach um, civil procedure um, and I also teach, uh, I teach a few different fields, but one of them is um, legislation and statutory interpretation um, and almost anything by uh, the guy who was sort of my mentor in, um, in law school, a guy by the name of uh, Bill Eskridge. Uh, mm. Almost anything by Bill is a fabulous read. Um, and so I, I don't even know if I could point to like one uh, one paper um, like that. Also, my uh, former colleague at, uh, at Penn, who is now at Harvard, a guy named Ryan Dorfler, uh, who's mm. a, a spectacularly uh, great writer, really brilliant thinker. He's a JD, PhD in philosophy. Mm. Uh, Ryan has written a bunch of just really fascinating papers that take um, uh, linguistics um, and like the philosophy of language, really. Um, and marry them with the law of statutory interpretation. And there's always like a really interesting insight in each of those papers. Um, so just beautiful, beautiful writing. I would say uh, a bunch of his papers as well. I'm sorry, I can't give you a, you know. No, that's great. That's great. That's great. Well, Jonah, it's been so nice to to talk. Um, the, we we met, uh, I don't know if you remember it in Paris at that crime conference. And mm -hmm. it was, it's really neat to see you again. Uh, in person, even though we're just doing it by Zoom, but it's nice to see you again. I'm excited uh, to get to share this with other people too. Well, I remember that that was the 2014, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, was it Sciences Po or uh, Paris Deux? I can't remember which one. I uh, yeah, I think it was Sciences Po. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I remember that conference. Favorite. I remember meeting, um, and uh, I've really enjoyed following your uh, your of on. Uh, uh, on Twitter and elsewhere. And it's great that we got a chance to do this. Um, yeah. And uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, cool. All right. Have a good day. You too, Scott. Take care. Gotta see us soon.